Hey, John here again, and it's time for another orchestral recipe. Uh, this one is based on Gustav Holst's uh, The Planets, and in particular Venus, the bringer of peace. And uh, yeah, let's just get right into it. We'll start out by listening to it. And as, as usual, see here, instruments missing. Well, they're actually not. It's just the focus function in Sibelius. So we can see all the pertinent staffs. Uh, so we can fit it all in, in the video. So I don't have to scroll around. So um, here we go. Okay, uh, so what's happening here? Uh, let's start with orchestration, as usual. Uh, we have the main melody in uh, the low strings, uh, and that's uh, mainly the cellos here, but uh, the double bass helps out here, uh, since it's this note isn't available uh, on the cello so uh, and it sort of overlaps here but it's kind of cool because uh, you can see the double bass helps out the cellos here boom and uh, then the violas takes over the line here and keeps going because uh, the cello cannot go can't go this high uh, comfortably. So it, the effect is sort of like a, a huge string instrument. Uh, so that, that's kind of cool. Uh, it's a great use of the, the strings, I think. And uh, so we have the melody here. Uh, and and the, another thing that's kind of, wouldn't say, unusual necessarily but it's less common that we have the melody in the bottom so in the in the low section of the orchestra uh, which means to uh, to be able to do that you have to have the accompaniment uh, above it because if you would have it in the lower regist register it would be really muddy and we wouldn't be able to hear anything so uh, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to get used to because uh, uh, usually we tend to think that the melody should be on top and the accompaniment below it but it doesn't have to be that way and uh, you'll, you'll just have to think about a few things and it works works out great so um, like I said we have the melody here uh, in, in the bottom register and then we have a high pedal in the second violins and this is actually divisi so it's just half of them of the violin section two are playing here and then uh they actually let's see yeah in the original score uh i haven't noted it like this because you wouldn't be able to see it anyway uh you have two notes uh beside each other which means that the the other half of the string section is uh coming in in this bar so it, it grows louder uh not by them playing it louder but by uh it fills up with more players and again here uh we get the first violins coming in on the same same type of element a high pedal same note uh but in the vc half of them and then all of them here in the crescendo so uh, and here it's easy to see that you have two notes uh, or rather that that uh, this 
the violins are divided up. So, um, what else? Yeah, so mainly the, the melody is here in this low strings, and then you have the pedal here, and this pedal is doubled by the flute up here. So this is one flute that's doubling it. And uh, another thing that is kind of uh, unusual with the, the planet suite is it's got, got a huge woodwind section. So in this case, it's actually four flutes. And you can see three clarinets and actually four when you get to the bass, bass clarinet. And it's just a lot of... Uh, a lot of people in the orchestra to be able to play this stuff. But anyway, uh, the violin line is doubled by the flute here. And then when the, uh, we got the chord here, this is a sustained pad in the clarinets. Uh, and uh, let's just listen to the first bar again. Okay, so you got uh, a B flat minor triad here, and uh, you got the B flat, so the root of the key is uh, up in the pedal. Usually when you have a pedal you, you have the root or the fifth, uh, depending on what works best, and in this case we get the root. And the chords here, we're gonna actually we can go just pop on over to the setup and look at the chords a bit easier. So you see here we have a, a B flat minor, and I wrote B flat Dorian here because what we have is actually listen to we've got a B flat minor going into an E flat major. Okay, I'm gonna make that a bit louder. So again. And again, the Dorian mode uh, is um, like a major, uh, like a minor scale, but with a natural sixth, so no flat six. So it, it's got a, a bit of a lift to it. So <clears throat> actually we can, uh, if we do this, just to compare. So we have, as you can, you, you heard here first, you had sort of like a, uh, I don't know, sense of hope maybe in that, in these chords. Uh, a minor and then going into the major. Okay, but if we would, change this uh, this chord to what it would usually be in a, in a natural minor key we would have a G flat instead Let's see like that so and listen to the, the change here it's pretty dramatic actually And in comparison, it's, it sounds kind of boring. So uh, I really like this sound, the Dorian sound. I, I mean, it, it doesn't work everywhere, of course. Nothing really does. But uh, it, it, since the piece is it's, it's part of the planet suite, so of course it, it, it's got sort of a spacey sound. Uh, and... Uh, Interestingly enough, usually when we hear sci-fi scores, they're it's so common to hear this Dorian feel, which is mainly achieved by going to uh, the one chord and then going to the four chord and letting the four chord be a major triad instead of a minor triad. So. Uh, but I think to look out for here is that uh, if we just listen to this 
this uh, version with the piano. And you can see, if you look at the chords here, um, I, I'm going to cover this as well, the minor triads moving in thirds. But uh, if we just look at the sustain pad here, and like I said before, a sustain pad is just uh, the criteria for it to be a sustain pad rather than a melodic pad or a rhythmic pad is that you have um, uh, all the notes are sustaining. They can move freely, but they have to be sustained, mostly sustained. So that's the sustain pad element. And, but as you can see here, we have three notes in the pad. Uh, I don't count the pedal here. So, but uh, that's of course part of it, but it, that's a separate element. So you got three, co uh, three notes. And in the next section, we have five notes. And then six notes. Oops. And basically, this is uh, just the same in octaves. You can even see it here. Same thing. You got F D flat B flat, F D flat B flat, and then we have uh, seven notes. Get three G minor. seven notes here again so um, it, it sort of builds uh, even though the dynamics doesn't change uh, it builds uh, orchestrally uh, because he, we he keeps adding uh, notes as it goes on and that's a pretty cool cool way to build a, a crescendo as well and you can do this to a much larger degree as well because we're not using we're not I think we're using maybe half of the orchestra right now we don't use any trombones or uh, no bassoons or well there's a lot of instruments that we're not using so it's mainly in the woodwinds here uh, actually it's all in the woodwinds uh, except for the pedal but um, what else? Uh, um, oh yeah, uh, the triads here, uh, minor triads moving in thirds. That basically, it's basically what it says. You have minor triad. So I see this this as sort of the the Dorian section. But uh, this is also, they, they sort of overlap here. So this is the minor triad that's moving in thirds. So I should probably do this. Okay, so the, the B flat Dorian thing is these three chords. So one, two, three. But the. The minor triads moving in thirds are B flat, G minor, B flat, minor. So I hope you see what I mean here. So, and what this is is that uh, you have the B flat minor moving down to G minor, which is a, a minor third down from B flat. Uh, and then it moves back to the B flat minor again. The only thing that changes is that uh, an F is added in the in the bass. So uh, and that's you know it's, it's just part of the chord. And the pedal here, uh, even though the chord sounds you know a bit out there when it comes, it can be sort of hard to to. Maybe get a sense of, of a specific key, but what binds everything together quite beautifully is this B flat here, because the B flat is uh, a common tone to every chord. So you get the B flat and the B flat minor triad, obviously, which is the, the root, and in E flat 
the B flat is what? You get one, three, well, one, three, five. So it's the fifth. So B flat is the fifth of this chord, and then one of B flat minor again. And in G minor, uh, B flat is the minor third. So this pedal works really well over all chords. Uh, even though I, I can say that a pedal, even if, if it would be some other chords that, that didn't contain the B flat, you would get a more unsettled feel, but a pedal will still work. So, but in this case, the, we could say that the pedal is, uh, uh, it's diatonic to all the other chords, or it's a, it's a com it's the common note that <coughs> binds everything together here. And another thing is that when we come to this, after the crescendo, it comes into this really, really cool chord, uh, B major ninth, uh, with the C sharp in the bass. And basically what this means is that you have a B major ninth chord, which is, uh, I can show it maybe here. Oops. Like so. So we got, uh, oops. Why doesn't this work? Ah, okay. Like so. So we got the B, uh, B here, then we have a Actually, I think it's easier to show it in C minor, C major, just be to, easier to see, sorry for the pun, no pun intended, uh, easier to see what notes are included if you're not very fast in chord building yet. So we have C, which is the root, E, which is the th major third, G, which is the fifth, and I can actually zoom in here, so we can really focus on this stuff. Uh, okay, so we have C, which is the root, E, third, G, fifth, and then we have the B, which is the major seventh, and finally, add another, another third, we get the D, which is the ninth. So this makes it a, a C major ninth chord. So if you're not familiar with chordal building, uh, I probably should do a video on that as well. But it's it's. Uh, it's not that difficult really. So everything everything you read in a chord symbol means something. It's, it's there for a reason. So when it's just C, it means that, that it's a major triad. If you have minor, you have to have a minor. Uh, actually this, I use a jazz font here and you can't really tell the difference between a, a big M and a uh, small M. Really, I mean, the size difference is there, but you don't get that. Well, you know what a small M looks like. But anyway, you have to designate if if if, if it's not a um, a major triad, which is sort of the baseline. If you write just write a letter, uh, it's assumed that it's a it's a major triad. But uh, so you have to write an, a small M after if to be minor. But in this case, it's not minor, it's, it is a major, major triad. And then we got this thing here. And this is sort of, can confuse some people because they feel like, okay, C, C, M, A, M, A, J. That, that's, that must mean C major, right? But no, it doesn't. Uh, it, what it means is that you have a major seventh. Uh, so the M A J, if you want to be follow sort of the standard for this, uh, the M A M A J is always pointing point, pointing out that you have uh, uh, the seventh note of a scale included. Okay. So so far we got C May C uh, C major, 
uh, and you got the major seventh, but in this case we also have a nine. So we got C, which designates this part. Then we got a major, which designates the seventh tone here, and we got nine, which represents nine, or and that's of course the same as uh, two. Okay, so it's not really that difficult. Uh, and you could, if we go back to this chord again here, uh, it, you see it's, it's voiced differently here. So actually we have uh, like this. So, uh, we got the five on top. Uh, no, I'm oh, sorry, we don't have the five on top, we have the seven on top, <clears throat> like this. We don't have any sevens here. See if I'm correct here. Oh, sorry. Uh, five on top. So, and then we have the seventh here because the it's the it's the pedal. I guess the seventh. So this is basically the voicing for the last chord here. Just that it's in B major. It's a B major nine with the. C sharp in the bottom instead of C major 9 with uh, D in the bottom. And the D is, of course, the ninth. Okay, I hope that wasn't too confusing, but uh, that's basically what this is. And in particular, you should notice this voice in here because this is a. I see John Williams use this a lot in his writing. Especially in horns, so uh, this type of interval makeup. And I started studied uh, jazz arranging via uh, Dick Rove's School of Music, and it was a correspondence course. And he talked a lot about different kinds of voicings, and he called it uh, shapes. And this shape is uh, a closed fourth. And what that means is that you have an interval of a fourth between B, uh, uh, sorry, between D and uh, G here, and then you have a note in the middle, and then you have a few options here. So you can either have uh, a whole step, which we have here, or you can have a half step like this, whole step, or. Uh, This. You have a half whole step between these two, or you have a half step. So that, but that's his uh, sort of voicing theory. I probably will get into that stuff as well. But it's only way to that you have to think about it is it's uh, if if you find some some voicing that you like, try to analyze the actual shape, and you can actually number it. So this would be a closed fourth, and then you would number it from the top, and you would count the half steps. So here you have uh, a minor third, which is three, because you get uh, three notes in between. And actually I could pull up... Keyboard here, okay. So, oops. Okay, here we go. So we got, uh, that's basically it. 
Uh, and so in this case we would have we would count the distance between that note. Well, oh, wow, well, it's cool. Okay, so so this note here, see, one, two, three, and then you have one, two. So this would be called a three-two voicing. Uh, and you see this type of voicing come up in a lot of places. So. Uh, if you have a, just put a name on it, you'll remember it much easier when you hear it and when you see it and before you know it, you'll just uh, start using it in your own voicings. And what this gives you is a, a more control over the uh, over the types of voicing you use because uh, you start to recognize the sound more and more. And this goes with everything you learn, basically. And and just a quick tip is that you you view each voicing as a uh, overlapping of, of three notes at a time. That's a pretty good way to look at it, actually, because then you can sort of dissect the voicing. Uh, but anyway, I, I ramble on a bit too much here. But um, let's remove this. So, um, okay, and uh, how did it come up with all this, all these uh, voicings? You know, I mean the harmonization all that stuff. I, I, I would, I, I don't know exactly what what his process was while writing this, of course, uh, but. Um, but a, a pretty common way to do doing stuff like this is that you come up with the melody first and then you harmonize it uh, on the wherever you want the chord change, which usually is on uh, usually every bar or every other bar or uh, well that's the most common one, but it, it depends on the melody of course, but in this case it's, it's pretty easy. So it starts out with uh, C uh, B flat minor, and then he, he lands on E flat, and then of course we wanted that sort of spacey sound, so we had the uh, E flat major triad. So listen here, okay, and then uh, the melody repeats, and the melody here basically outlines a, a B flat minor arpeggio, so. That's a no-brainer uh, how to harmonize that. Even still, you have options there as well, but that's the most obvious one. And then the melody goes to G, which is the uh, actually supports my Dorian theory here, uh, because lo and behold, uh, the G natural is. Uh, is the natural sixth in, in B flat. So we can just confirm that over here. Let's see. We got B flat. B flat. C. D minor. E flat, I mean, E flat, F, and the sixth. So if we have a B flat natural minor, we would have a, we would have a G flat instead. So in that case, we would have. So that's a sixth, and then we would have an A flat, and finally B flat. But in this case, we have a, a G natural. But even though uh, he could have used, uh, as you see here, he could have used the, the E flat triad again for this chord, or for this melody note, he used a G minor. 
And if you look at the, the actual triads here, the only difference between E flat, uh, always miss that. I don't know why. Uh, the, the only difference between E flat major and G minor is that you have a G. No, sorry, that you have a, a D natural instead of an E flat. Okay, so it's uh, it's just a just a uh, half note that, that uh, separates them, those two chords. Okay, so it's... Uh, and also, you, when you do it like this, you get a, an even more mysterious sound, as you can hear here. Okay. So again, I mean, he, he could have done this instead. But if we listen to that, you'll hear that it sounds... What I did here is I, I basically uh, changed this G minor to an E flat instead. So, and this should work fine. But you see, that's pretty boring, uh, because nothing is really happening here. And and th this music is very very simple. It's only three elements. You got the sustain pad, the melody, and the pedal. So it's uh, just tells us uh, how good of a composer Holst was, because uh, he always keeps it interesting. And, and you have to remember also that this kind of writing was new back in the day. Oh, such a beauty, beautiful chord. And theoretically how we lead in from the B flat minor to a B, mi B major. I'm actually not sure how, how I would look at that, but again, it doesn't really matter because what it, what it does here is, uh, and this is basically, uh, I copied this from the, the original score. So that, that's why we got a lot of sharps here, but also if we, if we didn't, we would have to call this C flat and that's just kind of weird for me. So I use B, B major instead <clears throat> or B, B natural instead of C flat. But anyway, melodically what's happening here, also make sure that you, you don't miss the clef change here. So we got uh, the B flat. We got a B flat, the first three notes of the B flat minor scale. Do, Re, May, and then a jump to the fifth. So, and then jump up to the, uh, to Do again, and jump up to five or so. And then it, uh, if we look at this as still in B flat minor, which our ears, that's the way we're hearing it because that's what, what we've heard uh, so far. And music is linear, so we, we can't really hear ahead, especially if, if we, you know, if we haven't heard a piece before, you have no idea what's happening, what's coming, you know? So our brain is totally in the B minor, B, uh, B flat minor world here, but melodically goes uh, do, so, and then uh, sharp five or flat six. So we got lay, uh, C or lay when it comes to solfege, and that's nothing weird. So it's one five flat six, but it's harmonized. Uh, like before, uh, it, it's. Uh, I don't think I did that actually. I'm sorry. Uh, 
where where did he get the harmonization from? Well, a great way to start if you want to actually end the harmonization. If you're not if you're not sure that you're in uh, if you don't want to be totally di diatonic, then it's pretty easy. But if you if you want to try something different, it's uh, basically what you have. You have three for, for any given note. Let's say uh, C here. I have to move over here. Okay, here we go. So, let's say we have this note here, C, and we want to harmonize that. Uh, uh, we got this. This is part of the melody, so we want to harmonize this. Okay, so you get uh, basically three options of a different major triad and three options of a different minor triad. And we won't get into augmented or diminished now. Uh, we'll just stick with the with the two basic ones, which are really easy to to make them sound good. But the, the other options are also there. But for now, just focus on these. So we got six options. Uh, so uh, let's start pretty easy here. So we can view this as the root of a C major chord. As, uh, actually, the way I do it is uh, uh, let's see. Okay. So root of C major. Uh, we can see it as the third of let's see. The third. If we just go through the major chords here, uh, the third of. as the fifth of F major. And I'm just doing it like this. So it's easy to see. Okay. So the same note as the root of C major. It's the third of A flat major, and the fifth of uh, F major. Okay, so that, that's the major ones. And then we have the root of C minor, of course. Let's see. And it can be the third minor third of a A minor chord. Like so. A minor. And finally the fifth of a uh, F minor chord. Okay, so we get uh, either C major, A flat major, F major, C minor, A minor, F minor. And if you listen to this, sounds similar, huh? And that's because it's the same relationship. We get the C minor. If we if we see C minor as a, as the key in this case, uh, and then we move down a minor third to A minor. That's basically well, actually, it's exactly the same thing that's happening here, only in the key of B flat instead. So you get the B flat minor, and then. Two minor triads, a minor third apart, and that's where, uh, one way you can look at it, where it's coming from. 
And in the end, I mean, it doesn't really matter how you look at it. You can call it whatever you want. As long as you keep calling it the same thing when you see it pop up in music, it doesn't really matter if you're not going to teach it at a, you know, college or level or something. It's mainly uh, between you you and yourself, you know. Uh, so putting the, all the names to, to things is... Uh, it's, a, it's a way to organize it in your mind so I highly recommend that but um, and there's <laughs> for everything that's ever been written you you can be sure there, there's a name for that technique already so <clears throat> if you can find the the actual name it's probably better to use that but it, if you just find stuff like this that pops up Name it however you want, just so you can remember it yourself. Okay, but uh, so I hope this was clear. So with any melody note that you want to harmonize, you can see it as either the root of a major triad, the third of a major triad, or a, the fifth of a major triad, or you can see it as the root of the of a minor triad, uh, the third of a minor triad, or the fifth of a minor triad. So you get six options straight off. And when you combine this with uh, all the ways you can combine triads and I mean bigger chords like this, it's it's pretty much endless. So that said, let's move on. Yeah, okay, so I, I was trying to explain where this beautiful but strange chord comes from. It's not really that strange if you're used to jazz and all that stuff, but uh, it's a very cool sound. And I hear a lot of Williams in this. Uh, or should I say, I hear a lot of holes in Williams stuff. But anyway, but like I said, Williams is coming from a jazz background, so he might as well have picked it up there. So who knows? But how, like I said, the, the melody note here is this one, which is the, just the sixth, the flat sixth of the key we're in. Uh, but in this case, it's treated as the fifth of the B major. So it's harmonized that way. And the funny thing here, if you look, at, I have a sustained pad in in parentheses, parentheses here. It's a hard word, uh, and that's because all these elements throughout a piece of music they, they transform because it would be if it's not a very short piece of music, you, you wouldn't keep everything the same. You know, you wouldn't always have the a sustained pad going through the whole piece or a pedal through the whole piece or, and stuff like that. So it keeps morphing. So in this case, uh, the melody goes up here, but that's not even the highest note now because we already got the pedal. And if you see the pedal here, it looks like it's changing the note, but it's really not. Uh, it just changes the, the spelling of the note. So you got a B flat, which of course is the same as an A sharp. So this pedal keeps being useful, but in this case, uh, it's the A sharp, which is the uh, minor. Uh, it's the major seven, seventh of the B major chord. Um, yeah, of the B major seven chord of major ninth. So, and that's also a really cool, cool thing. And it makes this, uh, even though it's a completely new chord and in a new key, I have step up, it, it doesn't sound out of place. It just sounds cool. And that's because you have so much going for it. You have the, the scale, the melody going up like this. And also by half step is pretty important <clears throat> because it leads much better. Uh, and you get the actual pedal, keeps going, but it's a, it has a crescendo, and it's it's reattacked here, when it goes into what I call the sustained pad, and 
yeah, and so so every element here, I mean, the, the sustain pad is just keeps going here, but the pedal and the melody just blends into being a part of this big chord here. So yes, let's yes, uh, let's just listen to the last measure here. Pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, that, that's how, how I view this key change. It's just a lot of things that uh, comes together. So uh, even though it's uh, a lot of new information for the ear, it's a, a lot of the old stuff. And a big, big part is the, the common tone here of the pedal. That we heard this note so long, so and it's part of this chord. Even though it's not a really strong chordal note, meaning that it's not part of the the big three, root, third, or fifth. It's the next thing after, so it's uh, and it sort of sticks out also because it's the top note. Uh, but it works great, and also the melody sort of gets in the background here because it sort of sneaks in here to be part of the the, the pedal um, the pad rather okay so uh, with that said uh, let's let's listen to the orchestral version again before looking at my my own oh uh, oh sorry another thing uh, look at the the dynamic markings we have a double P here and as commonly seen is that the melody is staggered dynamically so we want to have the melody one dynamic marking up and that's usually to signal to the conductor and to the players that it's a bit more important than the stuff surrounding it uh, so that's a thing to be aware of. And also we have a crescendo up to the mezzo forte here. Uh, okay, let's listen to it. So, uh, oh yeah, about the, the building that I talked about before when we looked at the condensed or the, the setup version. Uh, you get the clarinets, you get three clarinets all, all the way through here, but you see you get one flute, then you get three flutes going. And before the measure where it sort of uh, quiets down before while this is going up and the strings are getting louder and the flutes are getting louder you have uh, the bass clarinet as well and then uh, you got a new thing here with uh, the horns and the horns are playing that voicing that I, I try to explain you know the the three two voicing so you got Three here in between, minor third, and then we have the two. It's the whole stuff. Sounds like this. Okay. And another thing here, it's really easy for the woodwinds to be in tune here because they're playing triads. So try it and get the, you get the support of the English horn here as well. It is playing the lowest note as well as the bass clarinet. And uh, you get the oboes. Which is pretty low, I'd say. 
actually. But uh, that's the way you wanted it, so. Can get a bit honky down here, but I think it's, it, it works here because it's not a very subtle thing. So it may, might even play. Might works well anyway. Uh, and the flutes are playing triads as well. And it's they're overlapping here, so you get the F sharp here is playing in the same note in, in, in two flutes. Okay, so um, I think that's about it for the the model version, which like I said was by Holst. And then I, I made my own and uh, we can actually just go over to the piano version. So, oops. Okay, uh, my version is a bit faster, not much, but a li little bit. Uh, and I harmonized it differently because I, my melody was different and I, I wrote the melody first. So, uh, but the, it starts out in the same way, basically, I choral wise, because I wanted that, that, uh, Dorian feel as well. And as you can see, my chords are building as well until the end. And I have the exact same voicing in the ending of my piece as well. So here we go. works fine uh, so as you can see here I, I basically followed the, the recipe the melody with a high pedal a uh, melody a low melody uh, a high pedal and sustain pad in the high to middle register and uh, my harmonization was exactly what we talked about before I looked at the note we have a D okay what are my options? And in this case, I've done this so much. I was kind of I, I knew what I wanted. Uh, so I wanted that D major because I love that sound as well. Listen to this. So it's uh, you can you could see it as a secondary dominant, uh, which is uh, means that it. If you're in a minor key and you go up to a major chord, you can see that major chord as the five of uh, you can see that as the five chord of another another key. But in this case, it's not. In if that were, were the case here, this D major would would lead to G minor or G major. But it does not, so it just it's just two chords going back and forth, and which is a typical modal thing as well. Okay, but that's how I found the harmonization, and uh, you should really try it out because it, it's a great way to to find some cool stuff. Uh, also. Even if you have a really diatonic melody and chord progression, just try it. Maybe the second time around, try changing one of the chords to something that's, you know, out of the key, just for a brief moment, and and try different things out because you can find some really cool effects just by experimenting like that. So there's no there's no there's no. Uh, shame in trying things out you know more mecha mechanically that's what what techniques are for so try not to feel 
the way I felt for a long time that you sort of have to be like the myth of Mozart that you have to hear everything completely as it is and you, you sort of just take dictation from the gods or whatever uh, I read somewhere where, where someone claimed Mozart said that but forget about that you know that that's sort of a gift when, when you get that when you hear something and you're totally clear on what you're hearing and yes you, you can just write it down those moments are awesome but in most cases you you have to do sort of a combination of things so uh don't that's why we like i said that's why we look at all this stuff so we can pick up new uh techniques so we have a if you have a good technical foundation it's much easier to to write music so even those days where you're not inspired at all you can you can sort of uh get your bad days up uh up a level so you your bad days are pretty good anyway they're sort of above the line that it should be so and that also gives you confidence when you you take on work that you, because you know that however you're feeling that day you will come up with something that's at least good enough it might not be brilliant but it will it will be uh, acceptable okay so uh, See, my melody here outlines the C minor chord, lands on the fourth. Uh, and I started my melody low instead. So, and uh, we got the F major. So we get the Dorian sound. And I start an octave higher. Play the same thing, but then I land on the Ray instead, the second. And that's where we get this chord here. Okay. And then I have sort of a pattern here that moves up in octaves. So we got one, three, two, five. One, three, two, five. One, three, two, five. Up to the flat sixth. And uh, the pedal, same thing. Just the root of C. And as you can see here, uh, this is, isn't part of the chord, but it's a flat seven of a major chord, so it, it works fine as well. It, it's not dissonant in any way. And also, a pedal is sort of always in the background anyway, so you, you can play really dissonant stuff over it without it sounding bad. Uh, it's sort of the the thing where uh, if you have dissonant intervals, you you don't want uh, if you don't want a dissonant sound, you don't want you don't want the attack of the notes to be simultaneously. So if you have one note sounding and you get another dissonant tone after, it's a softer kind of dissonance than if you would hit both notes at the same time. I mean, you can try that on a piano yourself. You know, just play this play a C and then you play a C sharp and then you compare it by playing the C and C sharp together and it's a pretty huge difference and I, that's the same thing here so that, that works well and the C here becomes the major 7th of the D flat major 9 and exactly the same voicing because this is a voicing I wanted to incorporate because I really liked it and uh, yeah, that's basically that. So let's go over to the orchestrated version. And it's uh, virtually the same. I mean, but, but uh, you know, since my melody isn't the same, I have tried to use that uh, concept of a, of a huge string instrument instead of different, three different sections. So you can see here my double bass is helping out here in the beginning just because it's uh, let's see here huh melody was down uh, the volume was down for some reason anyway 
So it helps out here in the beginning. Since the melody is lower. Okay. And it's slightly less overlapping here uh, compared to the, the original version. So it's basically just the G here. That is overlapping. But it works anyway. And another thing that I added was the harp glissando on the third, uh, the fourth beat leading into C here. Uh, because I, I think it added something to the sort of crescendo we had. So um, I don't think that it sort of really does it justice. <laughs> in this mock-up version, but it, I, I really like Harpless Andos, so I added that anyway. And uh, uh, other than that, we have, let's see, my version started with the, the triad already complete uh, in the flutes as well, so not just in the clarinets. And uh, it's uh, basically the same concept. I try to add notes and build the sections up. So we have uh, uh, the bass clarinet comes in here. And we got all the guys and girls playing here in the last chord. And the exactly the same voice in here, just a uh, whole step up. But anyway, uh, enough talking, let's listen to it. thing that I would like to add before we stop this video is this thing here and what this means is just a small diagram of how you can arrange a melody and uh, this high mid low uh, that's the registers so uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, so the low register of the orchestra, mid and high. Or actually anything, it could be a piano or whatever instrument. And how we, we place the melody. So M is obviously for melody, and A is for accompaniment. So the most, most common thing is to use, uh, have the melody on top. And have some sort of chordal thing here in the... Uh, in the middle and maybe even some chords here in the low section or just the bass <clears throat> but um, the important thing is that uh, is that you don't have any overlap between the accompaniment and the melody and that's pretty easy here to keep it separate uh, and if you look at this uh, here we have some overlap at the end because this sort of climbs through the different registers. So here, here is low, sort of middle register and high middle to high register. Uh, but the accompaniment stops. Well, it doesn't stop, it, it, it sustains. But um, like I said before with the dissonance, uh, since we don't have anything really going on or playing here, so it doesn't really get in the way, so it's, it's really clean sounding. So that's a, a thing to keep in mind as well. And all these rules can be broken and are broken, of course, so... But it's... Uh, if you want to be sure that your your melody is heard and it's nothing gets in the way of it, if you want to, to, want it to climb registers like this, going from the top down or from low to high, uh, 
yes, you can, if something isn't working, I mean, it depends on your melody as well. If it's only chord tones, it might, it works better. But if, if it's something that might uh, clash with something else, <clears throat> I mean, if it's a half, half, no, half tone from some of the accompaniments, it's a good thing to have the accompaniment mostly sustained. So, uh, that's a quick tip. But anyway, so we can have the melody on the top, which is the most usual thing, and we can have the melody in the middle, which isn't as common. What this would mean, it could be maybe uh, the melody in the horns, uh, maybe around middle C, and you have some accompaniment uh, below it, might only be a bass line, and then you have some uh, higher woodwinds above it. Uh, but again, you want to sort of carve out uh, that register for yourself then, if you want a, a, a bit more busy accompaniment. So if you want, and you want the melody to be really clear, you be careful not to overlap uh, these two. And finally, like we have in this example, uh, mostly is the melody in the low register and then we have the, the element here of accompaniment, which is the pedal, a high pedal, and then we have the, the sustained pad in the middle. So it can be a good, good thing to be aware of, at least. And also, it's, if it's not a really short piece uh, and you don't, <laughs> or, or, or you, you, know, you don't want to, you don't care about being boring, you might keep it in one register and just call it a, call it a day. But usually what you want to do, and what most of the great composers do, is that they they keep shifting this around. So you might hear, and, and the melody doesn't have to be, you know, a full blown eight bar theme, you know, it can be just some small mo motif or whatever, something, mainly as the main thing uh, that you're listening to. Uh, so this could stand for main thing as well as melody, but anyway, you want you want to to keep the interest for yourself and for your listeners. You should try to vary where your main thing is. So if you see that okay, uh, I really had this melody on top for a long time now. Maybe I should move it to the middle or even down to the bottom and by by doing this you, you sort of automatically ensure that you have some interesting orchestration because if you have the melody here let's say you have melody in, in the woodwinds up here if you want to move the melody to uh the middle you, you can't really keep using the same instruments at least not if you want to have the same effect you know because while the flute will, would sound great here, in the middle, and especially if you have a compliment over it, it would get kind of hard to, to get it to project. So you, you're sort of forced to orchestrate around it and change uh, the main, uh, the melody or the main things, instruments to something else that suits the, the register better. And uh, same thing here, obviously. So, uh, it's just a it's a just a cool thing to be aware of because it's it can solve a lot of those issues where you sort of like huh I should change the orchestration here, but it, by thinking like this you you have a even more of a reason to do it you know, and uh, also it's it's cool to to hear maybe have the horn share accompanying uh, accomp in in some sort of rhythmic pad or just a sustained pad or some sort of pattern behind it and then all of a sudden it's it changes into a melody and that that's what really uh, caught my ear when it when I started listening to orchestral music how how seamlessly great uh, composers made the music sound it could go from really quiet section and 
before you know it, you're in a really loud tutti and you can't really, it's hard just by listening to hear where this, it, it, it's seamless, basically. You, you don't hear, it's not like uh, you have this four bar section and then bam, you're in some totally different thing. It, it sort of morphs into uh, the next section. And I, I just love that effect, so uh, anyway. I'm probably going to make some more videos just explaining this concept further because uh, I find it's a really, really good thing to be aware of. Uh, other than that, I think we're pretty much done. And I hope I didn't uh, talk your ear off and that you got something out of this. And uh, like I said before, try it out yourself. Uh, it's uh, Whenever I show something like this, just take the recipe and do something on your own or even better yet just find some short uh, part of a score that you love and then analyze it like i've done here just to the best of your ability and then try to do something similar and the good thing when you have the the model beside you like this if you run into something where you know oh, i can't get it to sound that way or whatever it can be it just means that you have to look at the, the original model a bit more to find out where you're, you're going wrong and where, you know. So that, that's why it's, it's kind of important uh, to keep it similar at first. Because like I said, this is, this is not for... Uh, I wouldn't send this version to someone and say like, oh, hey, look at me, uh, I'm such a great composer. This is mainly for learning the specific techniques and then when you you're in a in another project or composition or whatever this will float around in the back of your mind so and but you will probably misremember some stuff so it will come out in your own way so the important thing here is to look at the elements and sort of build a build a, a model in your mind for everything like this and also try to pay attention when you listen to stuff as well. Try to, you know, okay, the melody is in this register and oh, it sounds like a pedal here or and stuff like that. So even, even if you're not actively transcribing something, just being aware of it is really helpful. And what this does for me is it makes composition more concrete. It's something I sort of can toy around with and have fun with. It's, it's not this, uh, ethereal that's the word thing that's sort of hard to get a handle on it's more down to earth you you can grab a hold of it and sort of try things out okay so i hope this helps and as usual please comment uh, hit the subscribe button and tell your friends if you like this uh because the more viewers i have uh the more I can keep doing this. So thanks again and see you next time.